Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Welcome all from near and afar to Faith Matters with Philip Campbell, Catholic Variety Program broadcasting here from the studios of Good Shepherd Catholic Radio in Jackson, Michigan. And I am Philip Campbell, your host as always, and I'm so glad that you have chosen to be with me here today for another episode of Faith Matters. Now, if you've been Catholic for any length of time, you've inevitably had an experience of someone telling you to offer it up when you are going through something unpleasant. Maybe you've said it yourself to your kids or or those who are close to you. It's a very common Catholic response to life's difficulties. Offer it up. But do we think about what that really means? Honestly, sometimes we can say it dismissively as a veiled way of saying, shut up. Like, Mom, my brother's doing this. This is happening. Offer it up. <laughs> right? Just offer it. Be quiet. Offer it up. Uh, it's a way that can, can be a way to shut down kids whining <laughs> without engaging the problem. Now, I'm joking. At least I'm only halfway joking because people do say it that way sometimes. But presuming we're not saying offer it up in that way, uh, what do we mean when we say offer it up? Now, the Catholic faith contains a very rich teaching on this subject, and that is on the matter of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the principle by which we take suffering and we make it redemptive. We ennoble it with value that sanctifies us and makes us more Christ-like. So let's talk about suffering for a moment. Suffering is endemic in the human condition. Nobody can escape it. It comes to us in many ways. It comes to us as physical pain and illness, financial setbacks, disappointed plans, family difficulties, and my favorites, automobile and appliance problems. <laughs> but rich or poor, American, Chinese, Eskimo, wherever you are, suffering will touch you. Now, of course, suffering is unpleasant. We try to avoid it whenever we can. In its more extreme forms, suffering causes us to confront our own mortality, which we instinctively shrink from and revolt against. Now, few people, or I should say few balanced people, want to uh, undergo suffering just for the sake of suffering. Most of the time, we try to, we try to get away from it. Now, one of the most unpleasant aspects of suffering is how it can seem totally meaningless. In our ideal world, our ideal world, the way we feel it should, should go, the good should be rewarded with a life of ease while the sufferings of humanity ought to be reserved for the wicked. Now, even if in some sense that's how it works ultimately, and I'm talking about heaven and hell, the ultimate destiny of the redeemed and, uh, and the reprobate, that's not how things go on in this world, on, on this side of the afterlife. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, says Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, by which Jesus means that fortune and misfortune are distributed more or less proportionally amongst mankind. It's not necessarily related to our merits. I don't get exempt from car trouble because I'm a good person. Gosh, if that was the case, we, we'd all be saints, right? <laughs> if, it, if we got exempt from car and appliance problems by, by being good. But we kind of feel like evil fortune should be meted out more severely to the unjust. And sometimes this happens, to be fair. I mean, your drug dealers, your gangsters, your habitual liars are probably going to have more than your average share of troubles. But I'm talking more about things like cancer, things like hurricanes, things like human trafficking and terrorist attacks, things that fall on us more or less randomly and aren't related to what we merit or deserve in the big scheme of things. They seem so meaningless, at least in the sense of temporal causality. Why did I get struck by lightning and not my neighbor? No reason other than what seems to be blind, dumb, cruel chance. This is the most difficult thing about suffering. It's evident meaninglessness. Now, this is also precisely what makes Christianity so powerful. For the Christian faith is able to invest suffering with meaning and value that it lacks on its own. In other words, the Christian faith can turn suffering into sacrifice. <laughs> 
As we said earlier, suffering can be ennobled with a redemptive value. That is, it can become truly sacrificial. Now we must consider the concept of sacrifice and how it's distinct from suffering. Because while all sacrifice entails some suffering, not all suffering is in fact sacrificial. Let's say that again. All sacrifice is going to entail some form of suffering, but not all suffering is sacrificial. How do we really define suffering? I mean, we all know what suffering is when we experience it, but if you had to define suffering, how would you define it? Uh, I, I wrung my head about this for quite a while in preparation for this program, and uh, even though I know it's not the best definition, probably we could say that suffering is quite simply some degree of unpleasantness. <laughs> How do you like that definition, unpleasantness? It really encompasses everything. Everything from getting tortured by the Viet Cong to sitting in line at the Secretary of State. It's unpleasantness. Um, but seriously, though, it, it's some sort of unpleasantness that we have to endure. That's suffering. But sacrifice, uh, sacrifice is much more interesting. When we sacrifice, we voluntarily endure some form of suffering in exchange for some benefit that we expect to accrue as a result of our suffering. Now, I think I should repeat that as well. When we sacrifice, we voluntarily endure some form of suffering in exchange for some benefit that we expect to accrue as the result of our suffering. Now, let's break this down just a little bit, shall we? First, sacrifice is voluntary. It's the act of our will that makes a certain act sacrificial. For example, let's say you have a man who voluntarily gives his money to charity. He's making a sacrifice. He's voluntarily parting with his money uh, for an act of charity. That's a sacrifice. Now compare that to a man who simply has his money taken from him. <laughs> now that man hasn't sacrificed. He's been robbed. He's suffered, certainly, but he hasn't sacrificed. He's, he's simply been robbed. Even though both of them have parted with their money, um, the first man did it voluntarily. That's a sacrifice. The one who just was robbed, he just had it stolen, and he's just suffering. So for something to really be a sacrifice, it's got to be something that we will to do, something we voluntarily do. Now, we're going to revisit this momentarily. Now, second, what we will to do is usually going to entail some form of suffering. You're not sacrificing if the thing you're doing isn't challenging, if it isn't unpleasant, if it isn't painful. How many of you parents out there have had this experience? It's coming up, it, it's, it's like February, getting close to Ash Wednesday. You go have a talk with your kids and you say, so kids, what are you giving up for Lent? And they say, chores, or they say, homework, <laughs> right? We give up chores for Lent. Now, and you usually say, come on, what are you really giving up? We, we, we don't take that seriously. We take that as a joke. Why is that a joke to say I'm giving up chores for Lent or I'm giving up homework for Lent? The reason that's a joke is because getting a reprieve from your chores would not be suffering. In fact, it would be leisure. Leisure, pleasure, these sorts of things can't be the proper object of sacrifice. Sacrifice entails some form of suffering, something that calls for fortitude. It doesn't call for fortitude to simply give up your chores and give up your homework if you're a kid, right? That's like vacation, right? If you, if you get out of chores and get out of homework. Um, it doesn't entail any fortitude, and things that don't require fortitude aren't sacrificial. Now, finally, I want to note that uh, the third aspect of sacrifice, so it's voluntary, it involves suffering, and the third aspect of it is that we sacrifice in hopes of obtaining some kind of benefit from our sufferings. This is very important to understand. We sacrifice in hope of obtaining a benefit. The, the man who gives his money to charity, he, he hopes to benefit uh, those that he gives his money to. He hopes to obtain a benefit from God in the form of growing in grace and storing up treasure for heaven. The benefit might be for ourselves or someone else, but there must be some benefit, some trade-off. Sacrifice has the character of 
a trade-off, something, some form of benefit that we feel makes the suffering worth it. This is important. No one intentionally suffers for nothing. A man works hard at his job. Why? Because at the end of the week, he knows he's going to get paid, and he's decided that this pay compensates him for his suffering. Or to use a classic example, a soldier on the field of battle throws himself on a live hand grenade and brings about his own death because he believes that by doing so, he will save the life of his comrades. And that soldier who sacrifices his life by throwing himself on the hand grenade and obliterating his own body, he deems saving his friends' lives to be a worthy cause for which to give his own. When Jesus died on the cross, our Lord did so because he knew that his momentary sufferings would secure eternal life for millions. So, as you see, when we sacrifice, there's always some trade-off implied, something that we think makes the suffering worth it. Without some real or perceived benefit, a sacrifice has no value. In fact, it's not even a sacrifice at all. Imagine a man who slaves away all week for his wages. Uh, a man who slaves away all week for his wages is sacrificing for himself and his family uh, because he's getting compensated for, by the pay that he receives. If he wasn't getting paid for his work, this would, not, this would not be sacrificial labor. It would either just be a waste of time or it would be slavery, depending on if his work was uh, voluntary or not. The soldier who throws himself on the grenade in order to save his comrade makes a noble sacrifice. But imagine a soldier who threw himself on a live grenade for no reason. <laughs> I mean, that would be insane, right? To, to just throw yourself on a live grenade for no reason whatsoever, for no noble purpose, for no trade-off. That would just be crazy. So we need some benefit in mind when we accept suffering in order for it to be sacrificial. Now, thus far, we've only spoken of suffering and sacrifice in natural terms. Now it remains to see the supernatural application in the life of grace. We just said an essential component of sacrifice is some perceived benefit to be obtained, right? We, we hope to receive something for ourselves or for others. Now, we might not all have the chance to save someone's life or to give four years of our life to service in the military or to receive some sort of monetary compensation for work. We might not all get those sorts of, of uh, opportunities in our lives, but every single one of us, no matter our state in life, just by virtue of being a human being made in God's image and likeness, every single one of us has the offer, the benefit of eternal salvation offered to us by Christ. And that pertains to everything we do in our lives has to do with our eternal salvation or can be ordered to our salvation. And therefore, because of that fact, we can always make our eternal salvation the benefit which we hope to obtain when we suffer. So if, if sacrifice has to be done in exchange for some benefit, we always can have the benefit of our salvation before our eyes, the benefit we hope to obtain. All suffering, all suffering can become sacrificial when we endure it with our salvation in mind and apply what we learn through our sufferings to those ends. Now, I said earlier that sacrifice must be voluntary. And maybe you're scoffing at this. Maybe you're saying, you know, the soldier who goes to war and gets his arm blown off, he sacrificed for his country. He didn't, he didn't want to have his arm blown off, right? Or uh, the suffering of a 10-year-old girl dying of leukemia is hardly voluntary. How can all suffering become sacrificial when people don't always choose their sufferings? Now, sometimes in the case of the soldier, the soldier doesn't choose to have his arm blown off, but the soldier chooses voluntarily to enter the service of the military and give his, his time and his energy to the military where he knows that having his arm blown off is a possibility. So in a certain sense, that's still voluntary. But what are we to make of these situations where you have a totally just 
innocent person, a sweet kid who comes down with bone marrow cancer or something like that, that can't be said to be voluntary in, in any real respect. It's true. I mean, we don't get to choose our particular crosses. But in the spiritual life, they do indeed become voluntary when we learn to accept them as manifestations of God's will for us for our own salvation. Sure, I understand that nobody says, I choose to have cancer. Nobody says that. But rather, what we can say is, given the fact that I have cancer, and that I know God is in control and desires my salvation, help me to draw closer to my salvation through this experience of cancer. This is what it means to offer it up. Not, uh, not that we voluntarily want to suffer, but given that we do suffer, and that we know God is in control, and that he wants us to draw close to him and be saved, help us then, through this experience of suffering, whatever it may be, from whence ever it comes, to draw closer to God through it. Let that be our prayer when we do suffer, and that is how you offer it up. That is how you turn your uh, how you turn your suffering into sacrifice, and thereby we can take any suffering we endure. We can recognize it as part of God's plan for our lives, and use that suffering as an exercise of patience and trust to to grow in holiness, and thus render our salvation that much more secure. People talk about finding a meaning in their suffering, find, finding a meaning in their suffering. Uh, that doesn't mean, when we talk about finding meaning in suffering, that doesn't mean that you're ever going to figure out why it happened to you in the big picture. Like, oh, now I, now I see in the big picture why, you know, why I was struck by lightning because this had to happen, and then because of this, that happened. That's not what I'm talking about. Maybe you have insights like that about why certain things happen to you. Maybe you don't. Uh, when I was 29, I got a, uh, I, I, I had a, a, tu- a tumor, a benign tumor that grew up in my chest cavity between my lung and my heart. Uh, I had to have a very scary surgery to remove it. Uh, the surgery, uh, the recovery drained me considerably, took five years off my life probably, and, uh, you know, changed my life in many, many ways. Do I know why that happened? Do I Have I found the meaning in why I got the tumor? <laughs> I mean, did I learn things from it? Sure. But that's probably not the reason why I got the tumor. I mean, I don't know. I'll never know why I got it until I get to heaven, but that's not what I mean by finding meaning in it. Finding meaning in it is that regardless of whatever the causality of the tumor was, uh, I'm able to take that suffering, to, to take what I endured, and to turn it towards the Lord, and to say, Lord, granted that this has happened to me for whatever reason, help me to draw closer to you through it. And then it becomes meaningful. It becomes meaningful as an exercise of sacrifice, that builds one's confidence in God, builds one's love, builds one's detachment from worldly things that hinder us from loving God as greatly as we could. Now, this is why Catholics emphasize the redemptive value of suffering, because we believe it is redemptive, or at least that it can be. We don't love suffering. Uh, We don't love suffering for the sake of suffering, Loving suffering for the sake of suffering is just masochism, and we're certainly not masochists. We don't just love suffering. We don't walk around going, ooh, I I hope I suffer today. God, please break my furnace today. I I need a broken furnace or a a blown tire. God, I'm going gardening. Please give me poison ivy. I mean, nobody does that. We don't love suffering for the sake of suffering. We engage it. We engage suffering. And we turn it to something constructive, something redemptive. Jesus Christ himself didn't like the idea of getting beaten, flogged, and crucified. And we know this because in his human nature, he shrank from that. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed that if it were possible, that the cup might pass from him. He wasn't eager to have nails driven through his hands and feet. We accept suffering, just as Christ accepted it when it comes to us, and we turn our pain into prayers, but we don't court suffering or rejoice in it. 
This is why one of the corporal works of mercy is to comfort uh, those who are afflicted, right? When we see people suffering with painful diseases, uh, we, we comfort them because suffering, even though it has redemptive value, it's still unpleasant, it's still tragic. And our, our Lord, even though he knew that Lazarus would rise from the dead, he still cried at his death. Speaking of our Lord, one final note. It's only the ultimate sacrifice, that of Christ, which makes all this possible. I mean, uh, we're talking here about offering up our, our sufferings to become sacrifices, the redemptive value of our suffering. I don't mean to make it say as if we procure our own salvation by just suffering enough, right? Uh, none of this happens outside of Christ. Why do you think he died on the cross? The only reason our prayers and sacrifices have merit at all is because they're done in grace, the grace won by Jesus Christ on the cross. This is the grace that merits our salvation. This is the grace that makes us children of God, but it doesn't mean there's nothing left for us to do. To use an analogy that, uh, that the church fathers and the medievals were fond of, you know the story of the Exodus, right? God brings the Israelites out of Egypt. They wander around in the wilderness for 40 years, and then God brings them into the Holy Land, right? Now, God brought them out of Egypt with a, with a strong arm, and mighty wonders. He parted the Red Sea, sent the manna from heaven. He, he parted the waters of the Jordan when they passed into the Holy Land. So God was there. I mean, God, God brought the Israelites to the Holy Land, but they still had to work. They had to fight to drive out the tribes who lived there, because when they entered the Holy Land, it was full of hostile Canaanite tribes. And the, the book of Joshua and the book of Judges tell us that the Israelites spent several centuries engaged in hard warfare with these tribes to take possession of the land. God gave them the land, he brought them to it, but they had to do the work of driving out the tribes who live there. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, St. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Just like God brought the Israelites to the Holy Land, but they still needed to do the work to drive out the tribes, Christ procures our salvation for us, and it is totally by his grace that we've been saved and redeemed. Christ redeems us, but he allows us to work out the effects of that redemption in our own lives. And we do this by the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, by penance and asceticism, and also probably the most potent way by learning to take our sufferings and turn them towards God, to turn them into sacrifices that are pleasing to God and that redound in our own sanctity. This is why in Colossians chapter 1, verse 24, St. Paul says, I rejoice now in my sufferings for you, and I fill up those things that are lacking in the sufferings of Christ, in my flesh, for his body, which is the church. This passage drives Protestants nuts because Protestants reject the whole notion of, of Christians doing penance or offering up their sufferings or anything like that. For most traditional Protestant sects, uh, Christ's salvation is such that we don't do anything whatsoever. We have no cooperative role to play, no, no anything. It's just, it's, it's completely finished and there's no human component to it. So when St. Paul says, uh, I fill up in my own flesh the things that are lacking in the sufferings of Christ, and you ask, what does that mean? What is lacking in the sufferings of Christ? It's very hard to wrap your mind around if you're a Protestant, but from a Catholic perspective, this makes perfect sense. Christ wins our redemption, but he leaves a lot for us to do. He has redeemed us, but he wants us to be co-redeemers. He doesn't want to redeem man without the cooperation of man. Man fell into sin, by his own deeds, and therefore it is fitting that man should also be redeemed, uh, at least in part, that he should cooperate in his redemption just as he cooperated in his own fall. So Christ redeems us, but he leaves us a lot left to do, and that's what St. Paul's referring to here. And what we do is we, we offer things up. We go through life, we engage these difficulties, we take our sufferings, and no matter where your suffering comes from, even if it's your own fault, even if, you, even if you get that poison ivy because it was your own dumb fault you were gardening where you knew it was growing, <clears throat> no comment on whether this is a reference to myself or not. 
<laughs> um, but no matter where your sufferings come from, uh, you know, medical, mechanical, financial, whatever, interpersonal, you can always take that suffering and say, you know, for the benefit of my eternal salvation or for the salvation of someone, you know, I care about, I'm going to accept this cross that the Lord gives me. I'm going to accept it in faith that you, Lord, are in control and teach me to trust through this. Teach me to be better. Teach me the lessons I need to have. And I offer up all of these things to you for my salvation and for your greater glory. That's what it means, my friends, to offer it up. And so I want you to promise me that you'll think of all of this every time before you say, offer it up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That's a lot to think about. But it's good to at least reflect on and be familiar with and that, that when we say offer it up, let it not just be some, you know, Catholic saying that rolls off, uh, that, that rolls off our tongue without thinking about it. Let us reflect on the very powerful, deep, salvific meaning of offer it up. And then let's actually offer it up. Well, that's a lot to contemplate. And you've probably been having to offer it up listening to me ramble for the past 27 minutes. So I think that's probably enough for today. I do appreciate you hanging in there with me again for another episode of Faith Matters. So for Good Shepherd Catholic Radio, this is Faith Matters. I am Philip Campbell. And until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless. <laughs>